Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you and welcome to Islam and Life with me, Tariq Ramadan, broadcasting from London. In today's show, we will talk about the hardening of attitudes towards Muslims in the West. The disadvantaged position of Muslim minorities, the rise of Islamophobia and increasing alienation and radicalization have triggered an intense debate in the European Union regarding the need to re-examine community cohesion and integration policies. A report by the European Monitoring Centre on Racism and Xenophobia documents findings in the areas of employment, education and housing. It has found that feelings of exclusion are more marked amongst European-born Muslims in comparison with their parents. It notes that respondents in Denmark, Germany, France, the Netherlands and the UK reported that policies and public discourse in the last five years have negatively impacted on their sense of belonging. In the experience of some respondents, even those who had previously felt part of society, increasing alienation and rejection was felt. Islam and Life will investigate what the root causes are of this general discrimination and Islamophobia within the European Union and how Muslims should deal with it. These are important questions indeed. One would have expected after two generations of Muslim presence in Europe or in the States or uh, in other Western countries that the situation would improve. It's exactly the opposite that we are witnessing today. Islamophobia is everywhere. Uh, the negative image of Islam is something that we all can see everywhere in European countries. It's now the case in the States. We hear this in Australia as well. The situation is quite bad. So Islam is uh, portrayed as the, the religion of the other. It's the religion of the foreigners. It's not the Western religion. And more importantly, when it comes to job market, when it comes to education, when it comes to housing, uh, Muslims are facing discriminations. One have to, to, has to ask our, uh, uh, oneself why this is the situation, what is happening in the West, and why Islam is portrayed in such a negative uh, uh, perception and such a, a, a negative representation in the media but also among our uh, fellow citizens in the West. So many questions and to answer these questions I'm joined by Dr. Salman Said, who is a political theorist from the University of South Australia. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Uh, as we have seen in the clip and the figures are uh, worrying, the situation of Muslims, Western Muslims in all the countries, now it's something that we we can, you know, somewhat saying, no, it's only in Europe, but we have seen over the last few months that in the States is exactly the same. And in Australia, even in New Zealand, mm. we have, you know, discourses that are quite negative. You have to, to think about a, a, a historical experience. Someone would have expected that the situation would improve and it's not improving. Why do you think that the situation is so negative and so, so difficult today? I think one of the things we have to understand that this is not just a recent phenomenon, it's not even to do with the war and terror, which of course has helped accelerate some of these processes. I think more generally the problem really starts from the fact that as Muslims become more conscious of being Muslims, it has created lots of difficulties for um, Western societies. Partly because the narrative... Can you, can you explain this before going further? Okay. What does it mean becoming a way of being Muslim? I think because previously, if you think about, let's look at Europe, hmm. you had Pakistanis, you had Bangladeshis, you had Algerians, people from Maghreb, you had Kurds and you had Turks, but you didn't have Muslims. This Publicly, yes, yeah, previously. Yeah. Hmm. Now, at some point, around about the late 80s, in Britain you can date it more or less to the 89, um, with the Rushdie affair, you have the emergence of something called Muslim which transcended these kind of local, national, ethnic affiliations. Hmm. Part of that has been helped by the process of European unification anyway. Hmm. So what you have then in common now, for example, is Muslims, which exist in France, in Germany, in Britain, etc., hmm. rather than Kurds and Turks in Germany, etc., and this. And this has been a process both from the grassroots among Muslims themselves, because hmm. I think it's been part of a general awakening Muslim awakening throughout the Ummah, which mm. I think everyone is aware of now, you know. Mm. If you look at our parents' generation and their parents' generation, and you look at things like attendance at mosque, you look at all kinds of ways, Muslims are much more conscious of being Muslim. Mm. And that's also happened in the West. So the narrative that they had, that eventually, um, you know, you start off with the first generation, which is very traditional, the second generation, less traditional, the third generation will be... So there's a process of assimilation each generation. Dis-Islamization, in fact, yeah. yeah. And this has completely been thrown open. 
Mm. I mean, in fact, what you see is they're almost, like you said, the reverse. Mm. So that narrative about slow, gradual assimilation has it's just been erupted by my Muslims. But there is something interesting in what you are saying, is that what we heard, uh, and what I hear, for example, in many councils, mm. for example, at the European mm. level, uh, and, and among politicians in the West, the perception is that something's changed in, in fact, the European uh, minds and perceptions, saying yesterday we were talking about Pakistani, we were talking about Turkish, or about uh, Arabs, and now we are talking about they are all Muslims. So it's a transnational mm. threat mm. to the European uh, identity. Yeah. What you are saying is the opposite. In fact, it's not coming from the perception of the West, it's coming from the self uh, uh, definition of I the Muslims. I think that both processes oh. are going together, mm. because mm. I think this is very important to recognize that what we Muslims do have impact on other people perceive us, but mm. we're not necessarily responsible for their impact. Okay. So I think one of the things we have to understand is that is, um, Muslims themselves have gone through historical changes and transformations. Mm. Um, take something like in the 1960s when you had governments uh, in Muslim countries, and you know, in Tunisia, for example, willing to say, well, we should ban uh, fasting during the month of Ramadan. Mm. This was Burgiba's thing. Burgiba's thing, yes. yeah. Mm. Now, tell me something. Do you really think anywhere in the Muslim world right now, any government of any shape would be willing to make that statement? Mm. It's just not, impossible. it's been possible yeah. to. Mm. So something has happened, mm. and we can't forget that. Yes. And I think it's important to recognize that. The Iranian revolution, you know, the revolution in Iran, uh, many, many mobilizations. So you can actually see the narrative of what are the developments which have been going on in the Ummah, so which a are separate. Yeah. It's a two-way process, a two -way from, process. Within, yes. from within the Muslim communities in yeah. the West and also the perceptions. Mm. Now, okay, this is something which is more aware that we are Muslims, mm. or European Muslims, or Western Muslims. And or so Muslims. why... Sorry? Or Muslims. Or Muslims, just. Okay, okay. The, the, I don't have a problem yeah. with this, uh, understanding that Islam is Islam, but we can have a, a Western or Western cultures, and then yeah. there is no problem with it. But we can have, the, yes. the main point for me mm. is, so with this, why this new awareness is creating or could have as an impact or as a consequence such a negative perception coming from, from but the... But that's, I think, where the second part of the equation yes. comes in. And I think partly to do with this. Look at the countries in which there have been sort of major panics about the Muslim presence initially. You look at Netherlands, you look at France, you look at Britain. Um, and you Germany. Look at, uh, Germany, yeah. uh, more yeah. recently. But if you look at all of these countries, there is a sense in which the, the notion of pan-Europeanness, which is because of the European Union, has also meant a threat to national identities. It's more, what does it mean to be Dutch in a world of the European Union? What mm. does it mean to be French? in a world of the European Union. So in a sense, I mean, this is why I think the whole debate about the burqa is really, really extraordinary. Now, as you know, Tarek, and everyone has commented about it, the number of women wearing the burqa in France, in Netherlands, is minuscule. Let me give you an example from Adelaide, in the city there. The city in, of one, in Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The city of one million people. There is an um, attempt there to like, ban the burqa. Now, so far, people have worked out that there may be 12 women who may wear the burqa in a city of one million in Adelaide. Why? I mean, it is a monumental waste of time for yes. a legislator for all kinds of reasons. So it's not really about the burqa. And the reasons when people ask you why you want to do it, it says, oh, there was a bank robbery committed in a bank when someone wore a burqa and carried out a bank robbery. Yes. So, but this is the main, this yes. is exactly the point. You know, I'm just coming back from the States. In the States, we have 18 states now in, in the country, United States yeah. of America. Yeah. They want Syria. to ban Sharia. Yeah. And, and in some of these states, there is almost no Muslims. <laughs> there is just yeah. a, 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 unbelievable. Yeah. But still, it's there. So this is a but, pretext. This but, is not the, 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 the heart, the core no. of the question. But it's so more than a pretext. Because if you look at, for example, the history of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is virulent in Japan when there's hardly historically or even physically a significant Jewish community. Hmm. It's not the presence of Jews that make people anti-Semites. Yeah. And I don't think it's the presence of Muslims anymore which but makes people Islamophobia. Islamophobia. Yeah. This is the argument people always use against immigrants is that immigration causes racism. We have to limit the number of immigrants. Muslims cause Islamophobia, so if we limit the number of Muslims or people... So we change, we'll just, and this we'll change. The yeah, then we won't. So, so come to the point now. How do you explain that? So how do you explain, for example, that in Australia, in some of the villages, they are now so much against Islam and Muslims, while they have no Muslims living there. So how do you explain that? I think the narrative here is really it's, uh, comes down to the question about Western identity. 
And this is why I think the two things that we have to separate. The problems on politics of Muslim identification, which is something that I think it's really for the Muslim Ummah to sort out itself, and the problems of the West. And do these things linked for historical and contingent reasons. Mm. So people, in the, what has happened subsequently is that the idea of the West has now become an idea of distancing oneself from Islam. Now this is seen, for example, homophobes can become gay friendly in relation to Muslims. Islam was condemned. New alliances yeah, yeah. against the... But the, not just the, alliances, the but their perception. Yes. Uh, even if you're the most misogynist uh, Western male, you can always say you're much more feminist than Islam because it's patriarchal. Mm -hmm. So it's, Islam is always the counter narrative, the counter yes. uh, intuitively what you want to be. The best of you is always reflected in the worst of Islam. Whether that's got anything to do with Muslims or not. I have been at meetings here among um, leading anti-racist organizations, I won't mention any names, who mentioned that the biggest problem in the UK among Muslims was polygamy. And as someone once pointed out that you know, they've been living here 30 years, they hardly know any significant polygamous, I mean, I'm sure there are people, but that's not the major issue. Yes. If you go and ask Muslims what the major issue is, they will not say that. If you ask Muslim women what the major issue in their lives is, the hijab will not come up as a major issue for yeah, them. Yeah. Most Muslim women will not. Yeah, yeah. You know, they wear, they don't wear. I mean, it's not a problem, so it's not a problem for them. It's yeah. not our problem. It's yeah. their problem, in yeah. a sense. Yeah. And so I think we're dealing with them. There's a town in Canada, you probably heard about this, which is banned stoning um, for adultery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, no one was trying to stone anyone for adultery. There was no case. There was no reason for what, what is the idea of a preemptive ban, mm -hmm. just in case. So a lot of this crisis of multiculturalism... So